My name is... Well, I can't tell you that. You're not supposed to know because I'm not supposed to be alive. Technically, I'm not alive. But I'll get to that. There are two things that I want to get out of the way. First, those of you with any background in physics will fight me on just about everything that I say. I know it doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. And second, if you hate the feeling that you're always being watched, you should just stop reading. It's only going to get worse. Alright, now that I've gotten that all out of the way, I'll tell you my story. I'm part of a small group of astronauts that are sent to places around the solar system to fix things that NASA doesn't want the public knowing about. Usually it's just things in orbit like satellites, but I've gone to the moon twice now so that's something. The moon is, well, I'll save that for another time. One particular day, I was sitting on my back porch looking out into the country field. The weather was just perfect, not too warm but not too cold either, and the wind was just warm enough that it didn't bring a chill. And the sunset was really beautiful that day. The clouds looked like waves in the ocean, ablaze with orange light and a blue-green backdrop. That's the kind of stuff that I live for. Thankfully, my salary can pay for a nice ranch that gives me all the nice things in life. And then, of course, my phone rang inside the house. Its gentle chime floated through the screen door, beckoning me to answer. I sighed, and then rose from the creaky wooden rocker that I had been sitting on for the past hour or so. I headed into the house, silent as a mouse, and snatched the phone from its place on the wall. Brooken speaking, I said, sure to let a bit of irritation flood through my tone. Yes, it's Sanders. We need you for a mission. The man on the other end of the line said, it was my boss. Sanders hadn't been there when I had first joined the program, but he had been my boss the longest. He also knew never to call me during the sunset. Do you know what time it is? I ask, ignoring him. He thinks for a second. That's right, I thought we were in the same time zone. My apologies. He said sincerely. All I ever asked was not to be called during sunset. I would do any mission, just never call me at sunset. I sighed. Just let it go, I told myself. What's the mission? Lima has a lens out of alignment. Machinery on board just can't adjust to it properly, and we need someone up there to slide it back into place, he explained. The Lima Space Telescope was sent up into Mars orbit just a few years ago now, back in 2018. They kept it a secret because of how powerful it was. They were sure that they would find life with that thing. Not sure if they ever did. When do I leave? I asked, already knowing the answer. Right now, he said. Of course. I'm on my way then, I responded, and then hung up the phone. I walked back out to my porch to watch the last few minutes of the sunset, then threw on my father's old leather jacket and walked out the door. The drive to the base was pretty long from where I lived, about an hour. When compared to space travel, it was nothing though. But of course, a car isn't nearly as interesting as a ship is. Nevertheless, I came upon the empty spot in the desert and flashed my lights in the pattern that I always flash them, and the entrance to a ramp opened up from the earth, ready to swallow me whole. I drove in, down through the tunnel, and parked my little car in the lot. I even had my own spot, just for me. As soon as I stepped out of my car, a man that I had never met before greeted me. Hello, Brookins. Please, follow me, he said. His hair was long and black, slicked back with oil, and his eyes stared into mine as if he knew something about me that he was trying not to laugh at. I followed him down the hall that I had been down a hundred times before, 
and into the meeting room I had been in just as often. The escort certainly wasn't necessary, but I didn't say anything as a courtesy. Some things just weren't worth the argument. Please have a seat. He'll be with you shortly, the man said, voice cool and then he left the room, closing the door softly behind him. I noticed that he loved to stare right into my eyes. A few moments of silence passed before I started to think about the ways that this could go. It could have been an easy assignment, but it also could have been an impossible one. I've been tasked with the latter more times than I can count, but I somehow always pull them off. My father told me that luck runs in the family. After a few more minutes of waiting, all of which I was getting paid for, a woman with a shoulder length of black hair walked into the room holding a folder, trailed by two large men in suits. She smiled at me and then held out her hand. It's an honor to meet you, Brookins. I'm Tammy. I'll be accompanying you on your mission today. She smiled. Something about her eyes, it was just like the man that I had seen before. How cold and empty they were. And her voice sounded like she was trying to force emotions in where there shouldn't have been any. People like that are what made me believe that aliens really did exist. It's a pleasure, I simply responded, and then shook her hand. Another man walked into the room. He had white hair and a blue suit. Ah, I see you two are getting acquainted. Good. This mission won't be easy, he ensured. He produced a briefcase from his side and propped it open. Inside was a folder of images. They look like a machine. I see that in some places there were wires out of place. Something slightly off. This is the situation that we're dealing with. We need those wires fixed and the lens put back on track. And the whole thing polished like a baby's bottom. He demanded. I'm sorry, who are you? I asked. He looked at me for a moment as if I was a dumber than a brick. General Argier, he said low and quiet. Gotcha, I simply said. I've never been up close and personal with the Lima. Is there an advanced manual that I can look at? Yes, one will be provided for you on your trip. Argier responded. On the trip, really? It was always best practice to review the process of the repairs before a launch. That way all the correct materials and tools were provided. Tammy must have read my facial expression because as she chimed in. They already know the tools, I know the repair. We need you for your experience. I've only been up there once before, she explained, making unwavering eye contact. Her head had tilted a little bit, like she had noticed something. Understood, I simply responded, giving her a look. Good, get ready. You leave in an hour. I spent the next 30 minutes or so suiting up, then just waiting for everything to be ready. I had gone through the process plenty of times, and Tammy was certainly a rookie. I had to help her put on her suit and run through the basic stuff so she wouldn't kill herself. We sat next to each other in the shuttle, waiting patiently. I always dreaded this part. They launched us out of a long tube using magnets, and then the thrusters would take us the rest of the way. I almost always blacked out on the initial launch, though. I love this part, Tammy said, smiling like an excited child. I glanced over at her. Why? Well, I like watching everything fade from blue to black, she explained. Something was odd about her. She seemed way too excited for this mission. Your heart rate should be steady before we launch. I suggest taking a rester, I said, reaching for a bottle of pills on the wall. No, no, it's okay. I'm always like this. The doc said it's fine, she protested. I don't know what doctor would ever tell her that, but I dropped the subject anyway, putting my hands on the flight controls. Control, we're already here, I said into the intercom. I heard silence. Control. 
Copy that. Launching in 30 seconds. A voice that I didn't recognize responded. A weird sensation crept up my spine. The feeling you get when you miss a step when going up a set of stairs. Or a feeling you get when your parents are talking about something and you have no idea what's going on. I still don't know the best way to put it. But it felt like something was happening that they weren't telling me about. It wouldn't be the first time. But all of these people were new. And that rarely happened. The countdown began and I waited for my stomach to sink to my butt. Three, two, one, lift. And we were off. I blacked out of course but woke just as we were exiting the launch tube. Tammy was unconscious still. The thrusters began and we lifted up towards the clouds. I watched Tammy again and saw that she was now awake, smiling constantly like her life was officially complete. The first set of thrusters disconnected, and the second set took us the rest of the way into orbit. Just like Tammy loved, the sky faded from blue to black, and soon the slight curve of the black earth lit by cities filled half of the window beside me. The sun was coming over the horizon as we gained altitude, creating a bright orange lining over the edge of the earth. It was certainly beautiful to see a sunset from space. The automated computer system oriented our shuttle to the correct position, and I hit the glowing green button in the center of the controls. Once again, the shuttle picked up an alarming amount of speed. The thrusters used energy from the sun now that we were so exposed to its radiation, which also meant that getting to Mars would only take about two days in total. The ship would automatically accelerate and decelerate in accordance with the route, so I let go of the flight controls. Control, we're go for Mars, no issues to report, I said to the intercom. No response again. Control, still nothing. And did we lose contact? A few moments later, I heard a staticky voice on the other end of the line. You Brookins, clear for Mars. Stay safe out there. The voice said, though, it was yet another voice that I didn't recognize, different from the last time. I didn't respond, just clicked the intercom button to send a short click of understanding. Here we are, Tammy said, voice flat. I looked over to her and she was staring through me again. Yeah, I'm gonna go grab some food. You want any? I asked, and she shook her head. Oh, not yet. I ate right before launch. When do you want to go over the repairs? She asked. I thought for a moment. I'll take a look at the specs while I eat, and then we can discuss it. I stated. Then unbuckled my seat restraints. I took off my helmet and floated through the hatch door into the main body of the shuttle. It was small, lined with wires and screens. Two beds attached to the wall called my name. I was tired after the long night. I retrieved a small meal out of the cabinet and chowed down in the demoisturized clump of calories until I was satisfied. Over the next two hours, I discussed the plans with Tammy, who never stopped being strange, and then headed to bed, strapping myself into the pouch on the wall. Tammy did the same across from me, and the lights in the cabin dimmed. I fell asleep immediately. I awoke later that night. The cabin was still dark, but Tammy wasn't in her bed. This wasn't uncommon. People who were new to space often had trouble sleeping, so I figured that I would go and check on her. I wished that I had stayed where I was. When I drifted out of my bed and into the piloting booth, I saw Tammy floating in the air, legs crossed like a pretzel, and in the center of her lap was a single camera lens. The open side of it was faced up at her, and she stared directly down into it, eyes glassy. This area of the ship felt cold, goosebumps traveled up my skin, and the longer that I looked at the lens, the more I felt like a weight was being pressed up against my back and shoulders. 
my heart rate increased. My palms began to sweat. And Tammy just stared wide-eyed into the abyss of the camera lens. I wanted to speak, to ask her what she was doing, but it felt like that was the worst thing I could do at the moment. When I looked at that lens, it felt like my eyes were full. It felt like mutual understanding and self-consciousness. It felt like beauty and judgment. It was, in all respects, just like staring into someone's eyes that were only a few inches away. Like when you look at the flecks of colors in their eyes and admire all of the ridges and valleys in their iris. And then I looked away. The feeling was gone. I floated back to my bed and attempted to sleep, but ended up just closing my eyes. I couldn't trust Tammy. Something about what I had just seen screamed warnings in my mind. So I laid there and listened carefully for Tammy to return. An hour must have passed, but I still didn't hear her. I squinted my eyes open just to crack, just barely enough to let a sliver of light in, and almost screamed in fright at what I saw. A camera lens just inches away from my nose, with Tammy holding it, face smiling right behind it. I could only see her eyes and the puffiness of her cheeks with the angle that I was at, but I knew the grin was malicious. I could see the crazy in her eyes. I kept my composure and shut my eyelids all the way, hoping that she hadn't noticed. I laid there until the lights in the cabin brightened and a small chime played over the intercom. I opened my eyes as I now had an excuse and saw Tammy in her bed, stretching with a yawn as if nothing had happened. I tried not to stare. I didn't want to raise suspicion. Morning, she said with a smile. Hey, these things are comfier than I expected. Yeah, they are. I agreed with a smile. I slid out of my bed and threw a shirt on. Hey, we have another day until we arrive. We've already discussed the plans for the maintenance, but I'm just going to go check out the tools to see what we're working with, I said, floating over to the back of the ship, where a closet was located. Okay, I'll think I'll watch a movie. Feel free to join me if you would like, she said. I nodded and opened up the closet. I pretended to check the specifications of each tool until she had drifted away, and then got to the real work. I wasn't looking for a tool, I was looking for a weapon, and I hoped that I wouldn't have to use it, but I would want it to be safe rather than sorry, so I decided on a pressurized nail gun. It would probably take her out if I aimed right, and that's the kind of leverage that I wanted. The way she acted last night, it was more than unsettling, and I've heard of intruders getting on shuttles before her. The rest of the trip was completely uneventful. Tammy was a weird of course and the following night of rest contained no incident with that camera lens. I know because I watched it the whole time. I woke myself up with coffee the next morning. I was dang near dead of exhaustion, but I figured it was well worth it. Because, just like yesterday, Tammy woke up with a stretch and a yawn ready for the day. I looked out the window behind me and saw Mars there watching us. In orbit, I saw a bright light suspended there that I determined to be the telescope that we were told to repair. I took a deep breath and pressed the intercom button. Control, Mars is in sight. Estimated contact with Lima is 20 minutes over. I said, it would take several minutes for the transmission to reach Earth so I didn't stress the absence of a reply. And then I heard one. Only ten seconds later, I could feel Tammy's eyes on my back, like she was waiting to see if I would realize how fast the transmission came in. I knew that if I showed any sort of confusion, it could mean the end for me. So I faked it, of course. Copy that, Brookins. Everything is looking clear on our end. Proceed with repairs whenever you're ready, a voice said. The static was gone now. The transmission was as clear as day. I didn't reply, 
just sighed, trying to look relaxed. I must have failed. You okay, Brookins? Tammy asked from behind me. I turned my head around to her. Yeah, I just haven't been to the big red guy in a while. It's exciting. I replied, and I wasn't lying. Tammy smiled. Oh, I know. I'm excited too. I can't wait to see the telescope. I hear it rivals any other. She agreed. And it didn't strike me as strange that the only thing she cared about was the telescope. Not at the time. But I should have realized it sooner. I'm going to suit up. We arrive in 15 minutes and I would like to get this over with as soon as possible. I admitted. Alright, I'll get the tools together. I'll suit up while you bring us into position. She replied and we parted ways. I grabbed my suit off the wall and fastened all the brackets together. Pressure checks, seal checks, the works. We were about to be in open space, so now it was no time to slack on safety. I watched Tammy put together the tools in a bag and then zip it up. Hey, can you grab the sealant cream from the front? I asked her. She nodded and drifted up to the pilot's cabin. I quickly grabbed the nail gun from the closet and stuffed it into a pouch on my suit. She came back just in time. I took the cream from her and stuffed it into a different pouch. Hey, thanks. I'll go get us in the position, I said, orienting my body so that she couldn't clearly see the bulge of the nail gun in my suit. Wonderful. Let me know when you're ready, she smiled, and I propelled myself to the pilot seat. We were very close then, so I took manual control and began our insertion into orbit. We were about 100 feet out from the Lima at an equal pace with it. I threw on the autopilot and we were ready to go. I turned around to tell Tammy and briefly saw her stuffing the camera lens into the tool bag. I quickly looked forward again, waiting for a few seconds, and then turned back around. She was checking her suit safeties. All right, we're in place, I said, drifting over to her. Are your systems all good? Yep, all set, she gleamed. I nodded and we both went to the airlock. Control, heading out now, I spoke, then hit the button on the wall that depressurized the cabin. The world grew silent, saved my breathing, and a light on the inside of my helmet blinked. We were set to go. Tammy, can you hear? I read, she responded. I opened the door and nodded. We both drifted out of the shuttle, propelling ourselves with pressurized air packs, and then aimed at the telescope. It truly was a magnificent thing. Its eye was pointed away from us and into deep space. It was easily the size of a horse. It was silver and gold lined with solar panels. And as we drew close, I began to see the damage. It was just like the photographs. One of the mirrors was off its track and wires had been severed. Well, let's get to it, I said, grabbing hold of the side of the telescope. I tethered myself to it, pulling the hook from my waist and took a few tools from the bag, and we got to work. It was difficult to focus on such a thing now, when an entire foreign planet was below me. It was half an hour later before I realized that Tammy was nowhere to be found, and terror shot up my spine. Tammy, I asked, no response. I threw my tools in the bag and drifted to the back end of the rocket. Tammy, I asked again, she wasn't there. And then it clicked. The camera lens, how fascinated she was. This right here was a camera lens, and an enormous one at that. I wasted no time, shooting myself up to the eye of the giant machine, and sure enough, there she was, floating a few feet away from the gaping mouth of the lens, staring right into its core. Its diameter was twice her height, and she had a small, sand-colored brick in her hand. It had a keypad on it, and I recognized it immediately. C4 Explosives. Tammy, what are you doing? I worked up the nerve to ask. She just grinned, not taking her eye off the abyss. You, she chuckled. You have no idea what's going on. Give me the explosive, Tammy, I demanded, 
Her face turned into a frown, and the Lima itself shuddered. I released my grip on it. Don't make them mad, she said, serious. Look, they're waiting. I fought the urge to look into the black abyss so much that it almost hurt, but I succumbed to my curiosity. I looked over the lip of the lens and right into it. The darkness seemed to shift below the surface of the glass, pulsating, moving, like it was a container or the window to a door. The feeling of full eyes returned to me, and I felt warm inside. It felt good to stare. It felt good to be admired by whatever creatures were on the other side. I could hear them speaking to me, telling me that it was alright, telling me that they loved me. And then I remembered the C4. I pried my eyes and looked at Tammy. Oh, what will that thing do? I asked. They wish to be here with us, in this world so that they can love us forever. She replied in a trance. I almost believed her. Almost. Until I looked down again and felt brain-shattering nausea. A sense of pure disgust washed over me. This thing I knew was no friend of ours. Tammy, I warned, drifting closer to her. Stop. You don't understand this. You don't know what's going on. It's so much bigger than you. She began to scream in anger. Give me the bomb, Tammy. I shouted at her. She grunted, reached into her pocket for something. My hand didn't hesitate. I drew the nail gun fast, aiming it at her. And out of her pocket came a gun. I pulled my trigger and the inside of her helmet went completely red. Blood and shattered bone spurted out of her helmet directly at me, covering my visor. I smacked it with both hands, trying to wipe it off as best as I could. But it only smeared it around, amplifying the horror that I had just committed. I couldn't keep my heart rate down any longer, and it began to beat faster. I began to panic and my palms became sweaty. Her body slowly rotated backward, stiff as a board, and the C4 drifted out of her hand. I grabbed it firmly and then launched it directly at Mars as hard as I could. I drifted backward after the throw and stabilized myself with the pressure pack. They say that you can't hear anything in space. Well, they're wrong. Behind me, a roar emanated from the end of the telescope that sounded like the grinding of a chalkboard, vibrating my bones. I slowly turned towards it, dreading what I might see, and found that in the black abyss of the lens, another eye looked back. It was black, but the pupil looked like the static on a television screen. The eye took up the entire area of the lens. I couldn't help but feel like I was going to die. The scream started again and my body began to tingle. I looked down at my suit wondering what the heck was going on and found that I could see through it partially, like I was only half there. Suddenly, the C4 that I had thrown in the other direction whizzed by my head and hit the shuttle that I had arrived in. It exploded on contact with a brilliant light, sending debris everywhere and the lens, it cracked. Black tendrils began to reach out, looking for something to hold on to. I happened to be right there, and their inky black hands gripped my torso, bringing me closer into the black abyss. I began to hyperventilate. My mouth tasted a bile. The visor was still covered with blood and skull, and the bone-shattering cry came again from the inside of the lens. It pulled me closer and closer. My body became easier to see through despite me clawing at the ink. And the only thing that I could think to do was use the nail gun. And so I fired it right into the crack over and over again. On my last shot, I heard a cry of pain. The tendrils receded blindingly fast, and the feeling of full eyes went away. But in all the motion, the creature pulled Tammy through busting a person-sized hole in the glass, leaving me to wonder if it would come out. And then nothing. Silence. Just me, a broken telescope, and a blown-up ship. It took me longer than it should have, but when I looked down, 
I realized that my body was no longer there. I was a ghost. A floating ball of consciousness with nowhere to go. I couldn't feel my limbs. Couldn't touch my fingers together. Nothing. My body was gone. And that's what they do. You look into your cameras every day and they watch you back. They copy you, mimic you, and become you. They want out and they'll get out. I watched in horror as a copy of me with no suit on drifted out of the hole in the lens. It looked at me with pitch black eyes and static pupils, smiled, and floated towards a bright light in the distance. No, a shuttle in the distance. It all made sense. The quick transmission, the different voices. There is a ship following us, and that creature was about to board it. I moved through space without a thruster, without an effort, like I was a god. I tried to scream, Control! Control! I yelled, but of course, and nobody heard me. I began to sob. I began to flail around, trying to get myself to move and catch up to them. Nothing worked. I kept wondering what it would do with my body, why those people wanted to free that creature. I wondered what had happened to me and why I couldn't move. And most of all, I wondered why blood and shattered skull were still clouding my vision. I'm not sure what that thing did with my body. I still haven't found out. It took me 10 years to learn how to move my new form, and two more to learn how to use a computer. But here I am telling you my story, giving you a warning. Don't look directly into a camera. Any lens with an opening larger than a quarter is a no-go. And whatever you do, never get near a broken lens. Finally, if someone close to you suddenly becomes obsessed with photography, run the other way. They want you too.